Hello everyone. This month for Hobby Hopper, we decided to tackle the writing of short stories. And rather than make videos where I'm talking about my writing process or telling you about uh, the things I'm writing, I thought instead I'd make a video um, to help write, to help learn the skills of writing. Um, and in this case, I want to focus on beginnings. And very appropriately, I have my rather battered copy of Dune by Frank Herbert, which my mother rescued from a trash can and uh, gave to me when I was uh, much younger. And I'm going to read the first page of Dune and talk about what we learn from this opening. A lot of writers talk about how the beginning of your story has to pull in your reader. It must have a hook, so they say. And um, I think Dune is an excellent example of that in a way that doesn't feel particularly flashy. Uh, it doesn't, it's not shocking in the way that some hooks can be, some beginnings can be. Um, but let, let, me, let me begin. A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. This every sister of the Bene Gesserit knows. To begin your study of the life of Muad'Dib, then take care that you first place him in his time, born in the 57th year of the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV. And take the most special care that you locate Muad'Dib in his place, the planet Arrakis. Do not be deceived by the fact that he was born on Caladan and lived his first 15 years there. Arrakis, the planet known as Dune, is forever his place. From Manual of Muad'Dib by the Princess Irulan. In the week before their departure to Arrakis, when all the final scurrying about had reached a nearly unbearable frenzy, an old crone came to visit the mother of the boy, Paul. It was a warm night at Castle Caladan, and the ancient pile of stone that had served the Atreides family as home for twenty-six generations bore that cold, cold sweat feeling it acquired before a change in the weather. The old woman was led in by the side door down the vaulted passage by Paul's room, and she was allowed a moment to peer in at him where he lay in his bed. By the half-light of a suspenser lamp, dimmed and hanging near the floor, the awakened boy could see a bulky female shape at his door, standing one step ahead of his mother. The old woman was a witch shadow, hair like matted spider webs, hooded round darkness of features, eyes like glittering jewels. Is he not small for his age, Jessica? The old woman asked. Her voice wheezed and twanged like an untuned balisette. Paul's mother answered in her soft contralto. The Atreides are known to start late getting their growth, your reverence. So I've heard, so I've heard, wheezed the old woman. Yet he's already fifteen. Yes, your reverence. He's awake and listening to us, said the old woman. Sly little rascal, she chuckled. But royalty has need of slyness. And if he's really the Kwisatz Haderach, well... That's the first page from the paperback edition of Dune. And let me just see here um, if I can. This book is falling apart. Um, does it have? There's no, no information on the front here about uh, copyright or such, unless that page has fallen out, which is quite possible. Um, so I'm not sure when this uh, this copy came out, um, but it's certainly um, been around a while. Anyway. What do we know as a result of that page? First off, let's just acknowledge the somewhat clever 
um, you know, some might say a little arch, but a very interesting way of beginning his story by talking about beginnings. A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. So this tells us that the speaker, the writer, um, cares about balance, cares about planning, cares about making sure everything's right. It introduces this group called the Bene Gesserit and uses these terms like the Padishah Emperor, um, but also locating Muad'Dib on the planet Arrakis and being born on Caladan and being 15 years old. So we know this is science fiction, but it also has a feudal aspect with emperors. Quite a bit um, there. And then this idea of this opening paragraph as being from another book. So you have commentary on your story within your story. Fairly complicated, which tells us something. It tells us that this book is not simply a narrative. It is not simply a lively, entertaining story, that there is meta-commentary going on here at some level. Then we get the opening scene involving three characters, Paul Atreides, this 15-year-old boy, his mother, and the old crone. And note, that introductory paragraph talking about Muad'Dib, that he had lived his first 15 years on Caladan, that does not explicitly connect with Paul Atreides, this 15-year-old boy. The, uh, Frank Herbert, the author, does not use Paul Atreides in the first sentence and does not use Muad'Dib later on. But we know this is Caladan, this, uh, we have a 15-year-old boy, and so we make the connection without him having to say, Paul, who would later become Muad'Dib, or what have you. Um, impressive there of giving us enough details to tie it together without also adding, for example, the 15-year-old black-headed boy with a scar on his cheek, right? Um, it could afford to be subtle. But what else do we know about these characters? The old woman shows up, and she is brought in by the boy's mother. We know the boy is important from the fact that he's living in a castle. Um, and the fact that his um, um, uh, uh, implications in the writing, excuse me there, and we see that his mother is treating the crone with respect. Yes, Reverend Mother. So there is some complex relationship going on here between the Reverend Mother and Paul's mother. And we see that Paul, who is presumably royalty of some kind, nobility of some kind, is very aware and suspicious and um, processing things. He, he sees what's going on. He's not going to be caught unawares by what's going on. Um, a very different tack to take um, compared to a lot of other offers writing about nobility being very you know, fat and lazy Paul does not seem fat and lazy. His mother does not appear to be, you know, indolent. She's very, you know, she's immediately answering the questions of the Reverend Mother. But also see how w what we're introduced to pulls us into the story. We have this interesting first paragraph about sort of commentary on the, the, the broad sweeps of history, the broad strokes of history in this story. And then... In the week before their departure to Arrakis, okay, name we've heard before, when all the final scurrying about had reached a nearly unbearable frenzy, and we all imagine that moving, an old crone came to visit the mother of the boy, Paul. Why? You know, an old crone finding interest in a boy is a classic fairy tale motif. And introducing that into a science fiction story piques one's interest. And the fact that the boy is not, has not done anything yet. He's just some boy, but this old crone has, has shown up. It pulls us into that story a little bit. And then we get little details about Castle Caladan. Um, we get little details about the suspenser lamp, um, dimmed and hanging near the floor, implying that it's hovering 
um, and it is controllable. So some advanced tech there. Um, but the fact that the Reverend Mother is described as a witch, old crone, a witch shadow, hair like matted spiderweb. So we're mixing fantasy and science fiction elements here, but not in a way that feels um, out of place for a science fiction universe. In other words, she's not casting magic spells, right? Um, he lives in a castle, but there are castles in the modern world. Uh, they're just, you know, uh, <laughs> not used for fortification anymore. They're signs of prestige. Um, you also get the fact that the old crone is commenting on Paul's size and the fact that she knows that he's awake. In other words, he needs to be big. He needs to be more adult. He's 15 and there needs to be, you know, um, she is looking for somebody more adult and that plays into the first scene uh, of what she's looking for. She looks in and she sees a, a boy who presumably looks closer to 12 than 15. Um, and that is, again, hinting at later, um, later material. And again, that's intriguing. She doesn't come in and say, ah, the chosen one, right? Instead, she says, hmm, I wonder if he's big enough for the challenge. That's interesting. I wonder if he's physically big enough for the challenge. That's a more interesting detail than saying, um, you know, we must ready the boy for his trial of adulthood. Very interesting. And the fact that, again, he's awake, but apparently not making this clear, and she picks up on that right away. She is not the old crone in the sense of the batty old woman, you know, comic relief character. She's tuned in. Um, so a lot going on in this opening page, and that's really all I wanted to um, to talk about here is the fact that you can reveal a lot about your characters and their relationships to each other in a very small amount of space by being careful about what you're communicating um, and doing so in a way that isn't talking to the audience. Note, there are certainly details here there are wonderful details that ground the um, uh, ground the narrative in place and in character, describing the, the Reverend Mother, describing the castle and that cooled sweat sense. Um, but it's not an info dump, right? Most of this is characters talking, is um, noticing how characters are or are not relating to each other. Um, and, you know, again, without a character having to say, thank you, Reverend Mother, as you know, in our past together, I really appreciated how you did X and Y and Z, right? There's none of that here. Um, so I encourage you to check out the beginning of Dune as a really impressive example of how to lay things out. There's certainly plenty of other examples of this in literature, um, but, uh, uh, it, it's a very helpful exercise in learning how to write better. So hope you find that useful. Um, you might want to check out some of your own favorite books and how they begin for uh, advice on how to write. So hope you found that useful. Thanks for watching.